for the night. We have Dr. Cody Creech with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He's the dryland and cropping system specialist in the, uh, I believe it's Panhandle uh, Research and Extension Center in Scott's Bluff. He's going to start us off today talking about adjustments for spraying and dry conditions. And then Dr. Sarah Lancaster, K-State's Extension Weed Specialist, will be discussing, discussing herbicide-resistant grain sorghum and research on tumble windmill grass control. So with that, I will stop. And I think, Dr. Creech, you should be up next. All right, just let me get my screen shared and we will get uh, underway here. All right, hopefully that's working. Um, it says it is, so we'll just go with it and uh, assume it's all going well. So um, I'm excited to be here with you all uh, this evening. Uh, glad I'm not stuck somewhere in the snow that we're safe and sound in. I'm over in Hayes right now, so I'm excited to uh, be able to at least see some folks in person tomorrow, which will be great. I'm uh, really excited for the invite from the team that is putting this together. Uh, you, uh, you guys have a great team that is out here in Northwest Kansas, and and me being in uh, the western part of Nebraska, I had the opportunity to interact with a lot of them uh, over the years that I've been out here. So. I uh, do both uh, cropping systems and uh, weed science uh, work uh, in Western Nebraska and drying crops. Um, I did my uh, PhD with the University of Nebraska in North Platte uh, with uh, Greg Kruger, who uh, run who uh, used to do the uh, pesticide application lab there. So uh, we would do a lot with. Uh, uh, application technology in general. That's kind of uh, my main background in, in weed science was, was the applications. And so this, this uh, fits uh, well with, uh, uh, with kind of my background. And um, I hope some of the things I share today, I don't expect you to remember everything, but I hope you can find a few things that uh, you will be able to use to improve uh, e e either what you do on your own operation or those that you uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, provide us a, a support to. Let's see if I can get this to move. There we go. So uh, this uh, slide, I always like to start with this because I think it sets the stage well uh, for kind of my my uh, topic and my approach in general with the weed science. This is by uh, Sun Tzu, who was a Chinese war general that lived about 500 BC. And he was the author of uh, the book, The Art of War. And in that book, he says that if you know the enemy and know yourself, you do not fear the result of a hundred of a hundred battles. Um, and I I like to liken this to weed science. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we need to know our enemy, and and that is of course weeds, right? We we, we need to understand. Uh, their biology, uh, you know, how they grow, why they grow, where they grow, what their weaknesses are, what their strengths are. And, and if we don't understand uh, what they are, we will never be successful in controlling them. And so if you think about, um, you know, it, it's easy just to lump all weeds together and say, well, it's a weed, it's in my crop, and I need to go spray it. And you just hope that what that the herbicide you chose is going to, uh, you know, take care of it. Uh, but we need to be more specific than that. Um, on the other hand, we also need to know ourselves and uh, meaning we need to know what tools we have available uh, to control the weeds. And uh, it, if we only think about weed, weed science and weed uh, management in terms of herbicides, uh, we're never going to be successful if we just focus on that one aspect. We need to be more broad and think about all, uh, all the aspects of uh, weed science when it comes to weed management. So although my uh, talk today is going to be mostly focused on uh, herbicides, I do want to go through a few things related to other aspects of weed science in general. Uh, we talk a lot in weed science about the 
uh, different methods of weed control. Uh, there's uh, generally five classifications uh, for most folks. The, the uh, first is uh, prevention. And this is one that is probably the most difficult to measure uh, if you're being successful, because if you're successful, you don't see the weeds, but, uh, but uh, and if you're not, you see the weeds, but you, you never know if it could have been a lot worse, right? And so you're trying to prevent something that, that you can't see and you don't know if it, if it is a problem or will be a problem. Uh, but this just goes into the idea of understanding uh, where the weeds are coming from and how we can prevent them from, from um, making it onto our farm. Uh, recently in Western Nebraska, we've, you know, we've had a lot of snowfall this winter. It was the second wettest uh, January for the Scotts Bluff area uh, on record. And you know, we also graze a lot of cattle on our corn socks up there. And so, of course, when we had a lot of snow, folks started kicking out a lot of, of uh, hay for the cattle. Uh, and I guarantee you, not many of them were thinking about, well, do I have any weeds in this hay I'm kicking out across this field? And they were just worried about uh, feeding the cattle. But again, that's something that we need to be thinking about and be, be uh, uh you know, just uh, aware of where our hay is coming from and what some of the potential uh, weeds are that, that might be coming with that. Uh, that kind of ties into just other avenues of, of a weed seed dispersal, whether that's through the wind or water or animals. You know, weeds, uh, weed seed can come in uh, just from all over, really. Uh, some really interesting work out of uh, the uh, Southeast USA uh, looked at uh, weed seed dispersal from birds, uh, from um, uh, migratory birds. And they found that uh, as birds were flying overhead, uh, they were spreading seed across the landscape. And so again, that's not something we can necessarily control, but it's something that we need to be aware of so we know what we're watching for. Uh, the next one is cultural control. Um, so, this is, you know, cover crops, crop rotation. Uh, you know, if we delay our our planting or or we move into early planting, um, you know, the you know the planting timing is uh, is important because once we have a crop that's up and going, it really limits our ability to control weeds. Right? We we don't have nearly as many options as soon as that crop comes up as we do before that crop comes up. And so again, under understanding what our weed problems are going to be in the field can help us determine when we should be planting. You know, do we need more time to, to uh, control some weeds and knock them back before we get our crop up and going? Or do we need to plant early and hope that our crop will outcompete weeds that are gonna emerge later? Cause we know we have problems with, with maybe uh, warm season uh, weeds versus cool season weeds, you know? So that can all be a very important. Uh, cultural control uh, can mean just having a competitive crop. Uh, uh, this was our our uh, plots near our wheat plots near uh, McCook, Nebraska, a few years ago, and in our alleyways, anywhere we didn't have wheat growing, we had just a solid stand of Palmer amaranth. Uh, wheat is a very competitive crop, and you can see in the growers field um, uh, around us. Uh, there, the, there wasn't a lot of Palmer amaranth that was growing out there. However, any place we had some open ground, that Palmer came up really, really thick and tall and strong. And that just goes to show that, you know, having a competitive crop can be really good at weed suppression. Now, once this crop is harvested, of course, we need to worry about Palmer amaranth coming on later. Uh, and we need to have a plan for that as well. Uh, mechanical weed control. Again, this is something, uh, you know, tillage, mowing, pulling, hoeing. My favorite is chaining. I wish we could do more chaining out here, but uh, that doesn't necessarily work on cropland. We might need that for some of the Palmer amaranth we get out here. Uh, but it's, you know, anything we do physically to uh, remove weeds uh, can be effective. And this has been a challenge because, you know, we've, we've had this big push to move towards uh, no-till, right? And so we've moved away from tillage. We focus more on herbicides. And in some cases, that's really hurt us uh, with it, uh, in regards to weed control. Uh, we've took some tools away, and now we're thinking about getting back into some of those uh, tools. Um, 
this is uh, some work that was done uh, near Sydney, Nebraska by, uh, by my predecessor, uh, Drew Lyon, who's now up at Washington State University. And he looked at uh, tillage as a tool to control downy brome. Okay, and, and, and I think this can be applicable to a number of different uh, weed species depending on uh, the, the characteristics of the weed. Uh, but what he did was, was he uh, did some tillage in, uh, in some plots, and then he went back out afterwards and did no more tillage, but he would measure the weed density in the following years. And so you can see in, in, in that first year, um, in the no-till plot, he had 32 downy brome plots per meter squared, okay? And, and in his plow plot, he had zero plants. And then if you jump down, to the five-year post-tillage uh, in the no-till plot, he had 113 downy brome plots or plants in that no-till plot. And in the plow plot, he only had one downy brome plant five years later. Um, so again, he was able to get a lot of benefit from one single tillage application uh, that paid dividends for a number of years. And we continually see research that, that suggests that occasional tillage, meaning maybe once every six to 10 years, uh, doesn't necessarily hurt our soil health uh, a great deal. We can get by with doing it um, and then go back into a no-till system and, and really be effective at uh, reducing that weed pressure. And again, so that's something that uh, we can think about and use as one of those tools in our, uh, in our toolbox. Uh, the next uh, method is biological. This is one that doesn't really apply well to uh, agriculture uh, uh, in a lot of ways. It's more common in uh, rangeland. Uh, there's a lot of good examples in rangeland, not as many good examples in uh, the type of ag systems we, we uh, currently use. The biggest thing with biological control is you typically have to be okay with just weed suppression, not necessarily con uh, a control. It, it will kind of keep things in check. It doesn't really wipe it out. Um, and that's just the way it works. And again, that's something that's more common on rangeland than it is in in an agricultural field. And, and then uh, we get to chemical and, and uh, you know, I provided a few examples of, of some common herbicides. Uh, again, this can be a very effective tool. It's great to have in our toolbox and, and, and it's great to use, uh, especially if it works, it's very efficient. Uh, it sure beats uh, a lot of the other methods of, you know, for example, going out and pulling weeds, you know, anybody that's pulled weeds for, for, for any amount of time understands that that isn't very fun. And so using these uh, tools that we have can be very helpful to us. So that, that brings us into this uh, idea of, well, what's the impact of the drought that we've been having on our herbicide applications and how do we need to change this up a little bit to, to uh, maybe get better outcomes with our herbicide applications. So here's the latest drought monitor. Uh, looks like you guys are still far worse off than we are up in, in, uh, in Southwest Nebraska. Um, and hopefully we'll all find some uh, relief in this uh, coming few months. Uh, but we saw this in Western Nebraska uh, as well, where our herbicide applications last year were really challenging in a number of ways. Uh, the first thing that we had to deal with was uh, the wind that we had in the early spring. Uh, it, it made it it was so windy in Western Nebraska, and, and I assume it was down here, that even if you had a sunny day, uh, you couldn't get out and spray because it was just, just way too windy. And so we didn't have very many days that we could get out and actually control the weeds when we wanted to control them. And that allowed the weeds to maybe get a little taller, bigger uh, than we typically would have liked. Uh, maybe we couldn't get our pre-emergent herbicides out as soon as we'd like. A lot of things went into play, and that set us up uh, to be really behind the eight ball 
in 2022 as we try to get out and get uh, our our weed control going. And so uh, that gets us the okay. So what can we do uh, this coming year that might help us out and uh, give us some better luck? You know, knowing that of course we can't control uh, what the wind and the weather does all the time. So a couple of things to understand when you know when we talk about herbicide applications in a drought environment is that it can have a huge impact on our weed control, okay? Uh, that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody here. Uh, we had, in Scott's Bluff, we had some kochia that uh, we sprayed probably 30 different herbicides on it uh, at full, full rates, maybe even some 2x rates type stuff. And it didn't matter what we put on it, it did not hardly heard it. It was so dry, so hardened off. Um, it just didn't matter. You know, we could have dumped diesel on it and it would have, you know, kind of laughed it off and kept on going. Uh, so uh, there's some situations like that where, um, again, maybe we were out there too late trying to spray. And if we could have been on it earlier, it would have been uh, better. Um, but in general, most herbicides are, are, most effective when applied at 70 to 85 degrees. And when the plant is growing well, you know, when it has water, and that's because when it has plenty of soil moisture and the temperatures are good, that plant system is functioning. It's pulling moisture up through the vascular system of the plant, up through the xylem, and it's distributing that. It's pulling nutrients in from the leaves and sending them down through the phloem. And so there's stuff moving in the plant. It's going to move the herbicide well. Um, it, you know, it's very active. Uh, when we get dry, all of that starts to shut down and it's very limited on how much respiration is taking place in the plant and how much is actually occurring in the plant is, is really reduced. And that's why um, our, our herbicide efficacy goes down a lot. Um, and so uh, in general, uh, Herbicides like that don't do well, and specifically systemic herbicides uh, really don't do well uh, in in those scenarios. So uh, you know the the weeds and how they function can also change. The biggest thing that we see is that we often get a a, a thicker leaf cuticle that is harder to penetrate. In addition to all the other uh, physiological uh, changes in uh, in the plant and you know as far as plant functions and things like that um, uh, just again things just don't move as well in the plant when it's dry and, and stressed and it just doesn't uh, our, our control is not what we want it to be when things are dry so uh, the uh, biggest reason why systemic herbicides don't work well when it's hot and dry like that is because the plant is essentially it shut down. You know, it's not going to take it up. Those kosher plants that we sprayed in, in Scott's Bluff, uh, they probably didn't grow in more than a half inch over the course of a few months because it was so dry. And so if they're not growing, if they're not doing anything, they're just trying to survive. Uh, they're not going to uptake anything that we spray on them. So uh, any systemic herbicide, you know, uh, uh, glyphosate-based product, uh, SU herbicides, growth regulator herbicides, uh, grass herbicides, all those are going to be ones that are really affected uh, by these hot, dry temperatures and are not going to really do well when applied under these conditions. So what can we do when we need to get out and we need to apply a post-herbicide? Um, a couple of things you uh, you can think about is getting out and applying uh, those post herbicides early in the morning, because um, generally over the course of a night, a plant might recover from the heat of the day, that drought stress. They're going to be able to pull whatever moisture they can pull together. They're going to pull, and they're going to be uh, in the best place uh, as far as plant health wise early in the morning as they come out of night, um, and and so that's the ideal time. Now, again, there might be wind that's associated, associated with that, but uh, 
spraying in the morning is better than spraying in the late afternoon or evening. You know, although the temperature might be the same, the plants have more time to recover if you if we are out spraying in the morning compared to the evening. Uh, the use of adjuvants become extremely important when uh, we have these dry conditions. And if we don't have, uh, if we're not using full rates of adjuvants or if we're not using good adjuvants, it, uh, our herbicide applications are not going to be effective. Uh, we'll talk about adjuvants uh, a little bit later on in the presentation. So if we shift over to contact herbicide performance, uh, for most contact herbicides, they actually do better as temperature increases. And so I guess in one hand, that's a positive um, that as it gets hotter, uh, that uh, we see control do better, but that can also result in uh, the potential for greater crop injury. Um, so as as our temperatures go up with contact herbicides, especially over 85 degrees and above, we need to be very cautious about the use of contact herbicides in crop. Now, uh, in fallow systems, that's completely different, you know, uh, because we, we don't have to worry about crop injury. And so if we're able to, to spray and do a good job um, in a fallow area, then uh, there's a lot of benefit to spraying when the temperatures are warm. Uh, when using a contact herbicide. So what can we do uh, to uh, uh, maybe get the most out of our contact herbicide applications is, is again, if it gets too hot, uh, especially if we are applying in crop, you know, above 90 degrees, we, we really have a lot of risk of some unwanted crop injury. And so that's just a big a big concern and, and something to be uh, watching out for. Um, and so we see, well, it's too hot. So then we start to de delay our herbicide application and we don't want to be out there. And that affects our timeliness with our weeds. And that's, again, that's just something to be, be, uh, be to be aware of, right? Uh, uh, again, for contact herbicides, uh, best thing to do is have a high spray volume, small droplets, you know, to get good coverage. Uh, small droplets can be a challenge uh, in warm temperatures because uh, they evaporate more quickly, and we'll talk about that as well later on. Um, so again, uh, if we want to uh, lessen the uh, risk of crop injury, we need to be spraying when it's cooler. Um, and we can also reduce the herbicide rate or the rate of the adjuvants that we're using to kind of ease that herbicide down to limit uh, crop injury. Again, that's important when we're spraying in crop, not necessarily when we're spraying in fallow. And so with, uh, with uh, these uh, contact herbicides, um, the injury can be minimized when uh, when the temperature has uh, decreased, and we can alter those uh, those rates that we're using um, depending on you know the crop that we're working in and the situation that we are in. Um, for for uh, contact herbicides, um, the you know if we're again uh, just talking about crop injury. The first few hours after application are the most important. And so if we spray it in the morning and then it starts to warm up or cool down, that's going to impact it differently uh, uh, than if uh, you know if you spray in the evening and it's cooling down versus in the morning versus you know when it's warming up. Again, just things to be thinking about when we are out uh, applying uh, that type of herbicide. So spray droplet uh, evaporation is something we need to think about, especially when it's hot and dry. Uh, in, you know, in a drought environment, we're not going to have a lot of humidity either, and that's going to impact uh, herbicide performance. And uh, there's not a lot we can do if we don't have a lot of humidity. Uh, but what we can do is we can increase our droplet size so that the spray droplets that we use uh, are not going to evaporate quickly. So um, 
uh, I provide the example here of a 70 micron droplet, which is a very, very fine droplet, um, is which is, is, is smaller than the diameter of a human hair, uh, will completely evaporate after traveling 13 feet in the air. And if it's that small of a droplet, it's going to be moving in the air probably, you know, you know with even just a small amount of wind. Whereas just going up to 150 micron droplet, it will only lose about 3% of its size um, over that same period of time uh, with an 86 degree temperature was the example that uh, they had. And so um, we can easily increase our nozzle uh, or our spray droplet size by using different nozzles, you know, air induction nozzles or lowering our pressure, uh, things like that really help to increase droplet size. And, and that would thereby decrease the amount of uh, e uh, the evaporation rate that we're going to be seeing um, there. Because even once it contacts the leaf surface, uh, that droplet has to diffuse uh, the herbicide in, you know, through the leaf cuticle and into the, the uh, plant. And if it doesn't have time to do that before that droplet dries out, it's not going to be effective um, uh, at, at uh, controlling the, the weed that it is uh, on. So uh, droplet size uh, is important. It ties into the adjuvants that we're using as well. Once we're on the leaf surface, how quickly are we going to be able to get that herbicide into the leaf? So nozzles are a really important thing of what we do when we're spraying. Um, uh, it, it's, it's amazing to me how, how we use these big, big expensive sprayers that cost a lot of money and we don't regularly change out the, the uh, nozzles uh, uh, frequently enough. Uh, we often find that we have worn nozzles that have uneven, uh, uneven flow rates or poor, poor patterns. And really just keeping up on our, our uh, nozzles is very important. And uh, using different nozzles, depending on the, the herbicides that we are applying is important. There's, there's, not many herb, uh, uh, there's not many nozzles that can spray all the herbicides, right? We, you know, we need some that have good coverage. Others, we 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 can get by with larger droplets, and so balancing that and using different uh, nozzles to, for the herbicide that we are are applying is important. So this gets me into droplet retention. Uh, some of the work I did in my PhD uh, a number of years ago, I looked at uh, dicamba which is still a big topic, you know, as it comes to spray drift, uh, off target movement, we don't want uh, that to happen. So the, solu the solution was to use a large droplet, right? If we get big droplets, it's not going to move off target, but there's some negative things that can come about when we do that. So uh, we uh, looked at uh, uh, di a dicamba with a number of different uh, adjuvants and we use three different nozzles, the AIXR nozzle, which kind of is a coarse, no, uh, 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 it, 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 I, the AIXR produces uh, uh, coarse droplets. The TTI is a very coarse or ultra coarse, excuse me. And the XR is kind of a, a flat fan fine uh, uh, droplet. So we kind of have a, a, a different parameters there. We also uh, increase the pressure from, from uh, uh, from uh, 20 to, to up to uh, 20, 40, and 60. And we had a dye in there to uh, trace it. And so this is what it looked like when we would spray a plant. These were soybean plants that we clipped the top off. We had two nice big fat leaves that we were spraying. You can see the spray droplets on the leaves. We would uh, spray the leaves. We would clip them off. We would rinse the leaves off. We would measure the leaf area and we would measure the amount of dye that we collected uh, from the uh, leaves and to uh, calculate how much we were able to keep on the leaf surface. And uh, this is uh, showing the three different nozzles across the bottom there. On the right-hand side is the droplet diameter. Um, so, so, so those squares that are in the figure represent the droplet size. And the uh, green bars represent the retention, the, the amount of retention that we had um, from those, those sprays. And so a really simple uh, figure to look at showing that as our spray droplet increase going from the XR nozzle to the TTI, 
our our retention of the of the spray droplets uh, actually decreased um, on the leaf surface. And and so again, at some point, our spray droplets get too big that they won't stay on a leaf surface. Be, uh, just, you know, just due to their their sheer size. So there is a point where too big is is a very possible, and that could be detrimental to our our control. Uh, this is looking at the different uh, spray pressures. So as you can see, as we increase the spray from the spray pressure from low up to high, our our, our droplet size decrease. Okay, uh, but interestingly enough. So at a low pressure, we were able to, to have more retention on the leaf surface. Uh, that remained uh, true, or it reduced as we went to a medium pressure. And then it actually started to go back up at the high pressure. Um, this is, again, you have to kind of think of this as a spray droplet velocity. As we increase the pressure, not only does the droplet size change, but the velocity of the droplet changes, okay? So at a low pressure, we're gonna have large droplets that are moving slowly. Uh, and as, as we move up to the high pressure, the high, the high pressure will have smaller droplets, which we do see in the figure here, um, but they're going to be moving at a higher velocity. Um, however, uh, the, uh, the thought here is that we finally got to a point where the droplet size was small enough that we started to retain more uh, the droplet size is more important than the velocity at that point, and the retention improved because of the smaller droplet size. Lastly, just looking at the different uh, um, adjuvants, you can see if you look at the droplet sizes there, uh, just the addition of the adjuvants, it, it changes the droplet size, right? Uh, there is some variation in droplet size depending on the adjuvant because it changes the surface tension of the spray solution. Uh, so if you'd start down on the bottom with none, that is just clarity by itself, dicamba by itself, um, fairly low retention. And you move across to the MSO on the left-hand side where we had nearly four times the amount of spray we were able to retain on the leaf surface when averaged across the different nozzle types and the different pressures, okay? So obviously the adjuvant that we use can really help those spray droplets stick to the leaf surface and remain on the leaf surface, uh, which is, uh, you know, when it comes to a spray application, if the spray droplet doesn't stay on the leaf surface, there's no way we're going to control um, anything. So this uh, figure I like just because we, you know, if you step back and you think about your whole system that, that uh, we have to control weeds in. Uh, this is an example of sorghum. Uh, we need to evaluate what's most important and where the weeds are coming in at. So in this example, we can, we can see we have some kochia and marish cell that are there early. We have our summer annuals there, you know, uh, early on in the summer and, and through the summer. And then we, get, again, post-harvest, we have some marish cell coming in. So thinking about how we can, we can control these uh, uh, weeds uh, is important. So you, you can say, well, you know, what tools can I use to control kochia and marish cell early? What do I have that I can use in crop? What, you know, what am I going to use post-harvest? And we need to approach them differently. Uh, this is some weed emergence work that was out of ne uh, uh, Nebraska about 10 years ago, where uh, understanding the weed emergence helps us to make a plan, right? So so if uh, lambs, uh, not lambs quarter, let's pick uh, uh, marish tail, for example, we know that marish tail is, is a weed that is going to emerge uh, primarily in the fall in Nebraska, about 90% of it emerges in the fall. Uh, it can be a very troublesome weed uh, in crop to control. It's very difficult to control in crop. Um, however, in in our work in Nebraska, we found that just simply applying a 2,4-D or dicamba in the fall uh, pretty much took care of our issue, right? So uh, uh, the marriage tail is a challenge because you you have to be out looking for it to know that it is a problem. Uh, if you wait until you see it, it's too late. It's already you know starting to to uh, 
grow and bolt. And, and if you try to control it at that stage, it's too late. However, if we go out in the fall and we spray, we take care of it, but you have to be able to get out and you have to crawl around on the ground. You have to identify it when it's small and know that it's there. Um, kochia is another one that comes on uh, uh, really, really early. Uh, again, so if we're gonna con uh, control kochia, do we wait until uh, June or do we try to find a way to get ahead of it and, and control it early? Uh, these pictures here were taken in North Platte on March 9th. So kosher was up and going March 9th in, in, in North Platte. Um, again, is this already too late to control it? Are we already behind the eight ball? It's already coming up, okay? So again, having that plan in place and thinking about what our issues are going to be and how we're gonna manage them when they come up is important. This was from near, near McCook, looking at Palmer Amaranth emergence. Uh, the reason palmer amaranth is so difficult to, uh, to control is because it does come up throughout the whole year, right? So you can do a really good job controlling it, uh, um, you know, the first part of the cropping system, uh, and then the corn takes off and grows and you lose sight of it and you don't even think about it, And but it's there, right? Or you have another crop, you know, maybe it's wheat and you harvest the wheat off and then the, the, the uh, palmer comes up late and you have to have a plan to, to control it late. You know, we've seen uh, Palmer emerge late in the summer and it'll grow two inches high and throw and uh, throw out a seed head and drop seed at the end of the year. After you did really, really good job controlling it for 90% of the growing season and you let it go at the very end and, it, and it'll drop seed on the ground uh, just by, by being able to pull, you know, grow two or three inches tall and drop seed. So it's, it's a very frustrating plant to try to control. So we... I uh, wanted to look at for kosher control, uh, it, was there a way we could get try to get ahead of it? And this was looking at uh, both fall applied. So those first uh, two through seven were applied in the fall uh, in October, uh, eight through 13 were applied in the spring. And so what we wanted to do was just evaluate a number of different uh, soil applied herbicides that we could uh, potentially recommend folks use. Uh, to get ahead of kochia. And so when you think about kochia, you know, like I mentioned, we tried to spray it in, in the early summer this past year, and it was so dry, it didn't matter what we sprayed on it. So um, to get around that, rather than say, well, we have to rely on a post application, can we try to focus more on a pre-application? Maybe we'll find some rain uh, over the course of the fall or early spring that would, that would be able to activate that that herbicide and provide us some level of control. So this work uh, I did with John Spring, we had locations in Nebraska and Colorado, and I'm gonna show you the results here from uh, near Akron, Colorado. And it's slightly blurry, but uh, on the bottom, you, you can see the, the, the check where we did not spray anything. And what we did was, again, we sprayed in, in uh, October, uh, early March, and then we took final stand uh, weed, weed densities we took in uh, May. So we didn't uh, spray anything else other than these, and we, we took our counts in May. So our untreated check, we had about almost 13 plants uh, per uh, square meter, so a pretty good density. And uh, what we thought was promising was there was a few that we were able to apply in in October that essentially provided a, was able to provide us some level of control all the way until May, right? So uh, it didn't completely control it, but it did a good job at suppressing a lot of that and 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 controlling it enough that we felt like it gave us a leg up in. That even if we did come back and do a post application, which we didn't do in this example, it would have been helpful. We didn't have to con control so many plants, right? It really uh, uh, reduced the, the number of plants out there. So the uh, next year we went and we said, well, what will happen if we uh, uh, do some some uh, combination uh, or or mixes with with uh, some of those that did you know well? So we added uh, metribuzin or atrazine to uh, these different herbicides. Uh, did the same thing, we applied them in, the, in October and we applied them in, in, in March. 
And uh, same thing, uh, we had good, 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 we had good kosher pressure, um, and we were able to put the the akosha down to uh, nearly zero in some cases in the fall, and did pretty well with the March application as well. Um, again, so it's very encouraging to see uh, that some of these worked. The biggest thing though is, of course, we need to think about crop rotation. These don't all work for the different rotations that we have out there. Um, it might be a good option if you're just going into a fallow period, for example. Um, you know, there could be some good options there. Um, uh, and also, uh, it can help us spread out our workload a bit, right? Uh, we don't always know what's going to, uh, going to happen in the spring. And this past year, we never would have guessed that we would have had uh, a whole month of just constant wind, right? That we couldn't get out and spray. But how we have sprayed something early in the spring or late in the fall, we at least would have given us a better window or a better chance of being successful uh, later in the year. We would have had fewer weeds to uh, control with a post application. So let's get into adjuvants quickly here. Um, uh, if you think back to that uh, droplet retention study, this is basically basically what we were looking at. We had droplets that would bounce off. We had droplets that would hit and shatter um, and uh, go places. Uh, and then we had droplets that would just run off the leaf tips, you know, you know, after they were sprayed. And so adjuvants can really help to keep spray droplets where they need to be when they're put on uh, the uh, leaf surface. So uh, adjuvants have different purposes and you'll often see on herbicide labels, uh, they can, the recommendations on a herbicide label can be fairly broad when it comes to adjuvants. A uh, herbicide label you know, might say something like, you, know, you could um, apply NIS or you could apply an oil um, and it gives you different options like that. It doesn't just say use NIS at this rate. It says you could use this or you could use this or you could use this and it gives you a lot of options. And so um, I, you know, they do that because no situation is the same, right? There's uh, a different scenarios and depending on the weeds we have in the field or uh, the environmental conditions can really impact uh, the, the adjuvant that we should be using with a given product. So in this picture we have here um, uh, on the bottom here, you know, NIS is really important to break the surface tension of droplets and get, and get them to spread out on a leaf surface we get better contact with leaf surfaces, okay? Um, uh, in the example I gave of the dicamba droplet retention thing, uh, NIS helped quite a bit uh, to help retain the droplets on the surface. Um, again, it wasn't as effective as MSO, um, but it did help uh, quite a bit versus just, just spraying the herbicide by itself. Um, another example here, the droplet on the left contains no surfactant, the one on the right does. Um, so a, a lot of improvement in coverage and the ability of that droplet to penetrate into the surface, of course, uh, would be improved. So there's also some changes uh, that are plant specific, okay? So um, these examples here of giant fox cell, being a what's called, what's referred to as a difficult to wet species versus red root pigweed down below. That's an easy to wet species. And uh, just, just the leaf characteristics can, can really impact what happens with the droplet on the leaf surface. So uh, these two pictures here show a leaf surface where in, in the top one, uh, the, the spray droplet is being suspended above the leaf uh, cuticle and leaf area with uh, you know some fine hairs, whereas the other one, which uh, had a surfactant, was able to get down through the hair and uh, at least come in contact with the uh, with the leaf cuticle. Now, if, if you think about this from a drought perspective, if our spray droplets are getting held up um, in you know above the leaf cuticle, you know they're going to evaporate and will never do anything for us as far as control. We have to make sure that we're getting the spray droplet down to the leaf surface where it can at least have a chance to do something 
uh, uh, to uh, uh, you know get into the plant. Um, again, if the droplet's too small, it's more likely to get held up. It's more likely to evaporate. If the droplet's too large, it's more likely to bounce off or roll off the leaf surface. And so that there has to be some give and take. And we need to think about what's the best depending on the types of weeds that we're trying to spray versus um, the uh, herbicide product that, that, uh, that we are spraying. So uh, in the world of adjuvants, uh, there is uh, essentially an unlimited supply of adjuvants. There's, o there's over 700 adjuvants from over 40 companies. Uh, uh, every once in a while, the uh, compendium of herbicide adjuvants that's uh, uh, it, it is published. It kind of summarizes all the many adjuvants that are out there. Uh, Brian Young, who's now at Purdue, uh, leads that effort, and he does a really nice job kind of pulling it all together in one publication. A couple things about adjuvants is is that adjuvants are not registered with the EPA meaning they're not specifically evaluated by the EPA. It doesn't mean that anything can be used as, as an adjuvant or, or that that's the case. Um, there's many products that are uh, adjuvants that are uh, adjuvants that are uh, and surfactants that are in formulated products. Uh, obviously the EPA uh, registers formulated products and provides those labels. Uh, and so they are evaluated. Um, however, um, the uh, adjuvants and surfactants that are sold alone don't necessarily have to be approved by any uh, regulatory body. There are certain states like California, Washington, for example, that do have some uh, some additional regulations on adjuvants, um, but that's not the case in most states. And lastly, uh, it's re really important to understand that not all adjuvants are created equal. Um, a few years ago, uh, Richard Zollinger, up at, who was at North Dakota State, uh, shared a slide on some data that he had. He did a lot of work with adjuvants, and he evaluated, I think it was eight to 10 different uh, uh, NIS products. Um, and so he had one herbicide, he put the NIS product in, in and sprayed, uh, kept everything else the same other than he changed up the different NIS products. And he had about a 30 to 40 percent, uh, up to a 30, 40 percent range of control uh, just by the NIS product that he was using. So, again, he, the same uh, herbicide active ingredient, everything else was the same. He was just changing an NIS product and he was getting a lot of differences out there as far as uh, uh, control just by the product he was using. So, uh, adjuvants, they're not uh, officially regulated, meaning I could go in my bathtub, I could mix up something in my bathtub, throw it in a jug, slap a label on it and go drive down the road and try to sell it to, to farmers, right? Uh, there's nothing that stops me from doing that um, at all. And, and so it's just something to be uh, aware of that uh, there is a very limited uh, regulations when it comes to adjuvants. Uh, seeing this, the American Society for testing and materials, ASTM did come out uh, eventually with some some standard terminology, uh, standard terminology, meaning that we could better describe products and say, okay, an NIS must have this in it to be called an NIS, or an MSO must be this uh, type of oil and this much oil to be called an MSO, um, or an HSOC must have this percentage of this and this percentage of that to be an HSOC product. And so we were able to standardize things a little bit in that way. However, again, uh, still no regulations and there was no requirement that folks adhere to those uh, uh, terminologies. Uh, later, uh, kind of due to this, there is a trade association called the Council of Producers and, and Distributors of Agrotechnology, the CPDA. And they decided that they would get together and that they would offer a certification service where registrants could, could send uh, their product in to be evaluated. And if it passed the standards of the CPDA, they would slap their seal of approval, their seal of their seal of approval on the product. And uh, and hopefully provide buyers at least a little bit more peace of mind that that this adjuvant at least meets certain standards of 
of this council of uh, producers and distributors. So if you're unfamiliar with it, you can go to this website here. It's cpda.com. And then there's a CPDA slash certified product thing. Um, and currently when I pulled this up a few weeks ago, uh, you can see it shows 220 entries. And so there's 220 products out of that 700 that have passed the certification product, uh, the certif certification process. And you can go and you can sort by any, um, uh, you know, you can sort by the product registrant, you can sort, uh, sort by the product name. Uh, what's kind of neat is they also provide a, um, the, uh, they also provide uh, the, the uh, different uh, uh, traits there on the right hand side. And if this product has been approved for use in those given traits, okay. So uh, here you can see there's certain, uh, 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 registrants like Winfield and Titan Pro and Wilbur Ellis, these are folks that have sent their products in, they've been evaluated, and they've been uh, given that approval that yes, these are products that meet a certain standard. So it gets us from 700 crazy adjuvants down to 220 that we can at least have a little more confidence in, which I think is helpful to, uh, to us. So here's just an example of a label for, for R11. You can see on the right-hand side there, it has a little seal of the CPDA. Uh, this was an older one I pulled up right here. There's a newer type of a label that you might see now that's been updated. So again, uh, it, it doesn't, uh, it, it just means it's gone through an added step of, of being checked out that you can have a little more confidence in this product. Now, I don't know, um, I, I've looked at a lot of, products in my research over the years. Um, I, I won't um, say use this product by this guy or by this company. Um, what I will recommend is that you use a product that's been approved by the CPDA. Uh, most of those products I would say are good products. Um, and then if you don't know for sure, uh, the best thing to do is just, just to put them to the test. And if you have a large field you're spraying, uh, mix one spray load with one adjuvant uh, or surfactant or whatever. And in the next load, try the other one and then just see uh, how the control looks. And if you see any differences in, in control or crop safety or anything. Um, don't, uh, don't go by uh, just the price of the adjuvant and say, well, this is the cheapest NIS out there. So that's what I'm gonna use. Uh, try to find a good adjuvant that is um, that is uh, certified or that will at least work well for for uh, what you are trying to do out there. But put them to the test and see what uh, works best. Um, and then use adjuvants to increase control. and And I just wanted to share uh, this work we did this past year. We were looking at uh, the beyond and aggressor herbicides. Uh, we sprayed these all with MSOs. The one thing we did do, as you'll see in treatments four, uh, seven, and 10, we, we added uh, just three gallons of 3200. Um, uh, we did change the, the, the gallons per acre as well there, but I want you just to focus on treatments four, seven, and 10 that had that, that additional uh, uh, 3200 that was in there. Um, in our downy brome biomass uh, that we took uh, in the middle of summer, uh, you can see that those three that had that, that uh, additional UAN uh, actually improved. And uh, Beyond is one that it has a history where early on when it was first released, uh, the uh, use of UAN was, was, was kind of frowned upon, uh, but it is accepted now it's, and it's something that, uh, uh, you can put um, put uh, even more than we use in this study uh, to uh, help to bump up that control, and and it's something that uh, might be be helpful uh, when we have a dry environment. Uh, jointed goat grass control has always been a challenge. We didn't see the same grouping of those uh, four, seven, and ten uh, for the biomass control there. One thing I do think it's fun to point out though here is you see that all three beyond uh, treatments are uh, kind of grouped together um, as, 
as having very low uh, uh, biomass, right? M meaning very good control. So low is good. And, 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 and so just comparing the beyond to the aggressor herbicides, uh, you see that improvement there. We did take the, the adjointed goat grass and we threshed the seeds and that really didn't change much as far as uh, the, uh, the uh, rankings. You see those beyond, uh, herbicide, those beyond herbicides are still off to the right hand side with, with, with very few seeds produced. And that one with the UAN uh, did a little a little bit better as far as uh, you know not statistically, but uh, uh, they're kind of anecdotally you can see that it, that that it would have uh, fewer uh, seeds. So uh, in this example, increasing the carry volume did not necessarily uh, help us uh, improve our control. Um, the the I don't know if that's truly the case. Where our example here, we sprayed in a fallow field. Um, it's possible that having a higher carry volume would actually help us uh, if we were spraying in a crop canopy. Um, but the use of the UAN did uh, help to improve uh, 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 control of uh, both uh, downy brome um, in this example. So just to kind of wrap up and bring this back to our, our old Chinese general, um, just again, think about what weeds are you trying to deal with, right? What are their weaknesses and how can we attack these weeds at different ways? You know, we talked a lot about herbicides and adjuvants today, but I'm of the opinion that you use all the tools that you can possibly use uh, to, uh, to uh, control these. And if that includes tillage, um, then, then that's what we use, right? Um, uh, and then we need to understand the tools we have at our disposal, and and if that's uh, um, using that tillage, then then we can use it on occasion, and we might find that that that, that just just using it once in a few years is going to really help us out in the long term to keep those weeds under control. Um, as you think about uh, your herbicide applications, uh, find ways to get out early um, and 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 say that and stay ahead of the weeds. Obviously there's challenges with winds and environmental conditions that can cause us issues. Um, but uh, there's ways we can get we can get around it. And uh, honestly, there's some cases where it's just so darn dry, uh, like we had in Scott's Bluff uh, this year, it doesn't matter what you put on it, it's not gonna change anything. Uh, the weeds, you know, if the weeds aren't growing, the crop's probably not go uh, going to grow well either. Um, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, so uh, just things to to uh, to uh, think about. There's not good answers when it's so so dry, but there's a few things that we can tweak that can possibly help us uh, improve our applications. And that is what I have to share with you today. So with that, I think uh, I'll quit sharing my screen so that Sarah can get her hers. Hey, we up. did have uh, one question, which I think you pretty well addressed with and that was asking about adding in a half gallon of 32 percent nitrogen that was when you were talking about the mm -hmm. adjuvants right I'll yeah that uh do you see i mean do you get your example was on downy brome and uh, joint of goat grass do you see that benefit say in a fallow situation uh if you add in 32 percent you see that same benefit of getting that positive weed control? You would see that for a number of different herbicides. Uh, you won't see it all the time, um, but I think there's value there, but there's also a, a cost associated with that as well, right? And so it's not something I would say you do it all the time. You you do it, um, uh, it if it makes sense and it, with a particular herbicide that's being used or uh, in the scenario, right? Um, but uh, I think focusing on making sure we have good adjuvants in our tank that we're using ones that are reputable and that we're using good, you know, good approved rates and we're crossing all of our other T's and dotting our I's and other things would, would really help us. See, I don't see anything else uh, unless. Cody, I had a, oh. <laughs> I had, I had a yeah, question. Go, yeah, uh, go ahead. Keith Van Skyk and I'm in Norton County and I cover part of the, some of the counties here, but 
on the on the downy broom where uh, you were able to plow it under and um, what, what I mean would there be other seeds I mean what could you attribute that to either they decayed in the ground or they were buried or whatever or poor germination after they've been in the ground or would there have been other other seeds that would not have decayed and worked their way back up I mean, is I guess what I'm asking right so uh, that's very dependent on the weed species so in this case we're talking downy brome um the, they're obviously uh you know the uh seed bank and how long a weed seed can survive in the soil is very important and so if we turn that those seeds upside down in the soil and can bury them sufficiently so that they don't emerge uh, that can be effective uh, if you think about uh, you know I really like to talk about for, uh, a kosher for example kosher is a very a very weak seed it, it's not very competitive at all um, if you bury it even a half inch it it will not emerge it's too much for it and uh, so tillers mm. can be very effective on kosher the challenge is, is that the way kosher distributes, it usually doesn't stay in one field, right? So even if you did that in your field and it's going to blow in from the neighbor's field or something and uh, you're going to have kosher yeah. there regardless, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, but, the, but the good thing about kosher, though, is its seed viability is very poor. It only lasts yeah. in the soil about a year. In, in, in some cases, you might see a small portion that comes up after two years or three. But if you bury that seed for a, a couple of years, you pretty much level the playing field if you can keep it from coming in. Now, there's other weed species like Palmer, like you could bury it this year. And if you till your field up again in 10 years, some of that will resurface, right? And it might emerge again once you do more tillage and you bring it back yeah. up to the surface. Well, so, I can yeah, yeah, I can tell you my garden is probably 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, see, and so it very much depends on the weeds we're trying to address. Yeah. Morning, you know, uh, like a field bindweed, boy, that seed's going to be good for 100 years. So you bury it today, yes. and your uh, your uh, uh, grandkids in, in three generations are going to dig it up, and they'll have bindweed again, right? So it really just depends, but um, good question. Good. That's it. Thank you. Cody, I have a question for you. This is Jeannie. And um, occasionally I get questions about carrier volume um, on Paraquat, you know, when we're burning down, uh, uh, you know, burning down in mm -hmm. the fallow period. Can you give us some guidelines of what you would be, what you think for running Paraquat? Because coverage is so important on that. Right. So um, with with Paraquat, there's a balance. Um, there is the balance of the uh, the carrier volume combined with the spray droplets, right? So we can put on a high volume, but uh, but uh, there's a limit to what we can put on. Essentially, I mean, you can get to a point where there's too much, and uh, and it also dilutes the uh, product, right? So uh, products work, uh, work best when they have high concentrations of their product. And uh, so there's that balance as well. Um, I think uh, for uh, a Paraquat, to me, it makes most sense to stay at, a at at least a 20 gallon per acre rate. I, I probably wouldn't go over 30. I don't think there's benefit to go over 30, but if you could get up to 20, uh, that's probably gonna be your sweet spot um, as far as uh, a, a carrier for, for that. And then, of course, pair that with an appropriate droplet size, and hopefully you can find a day that's not terribly windy to, to, uh, to make those applications as well. Thanks, Cody. I know, you know, as we are struggling sometimes with it, with post-emergence applications, Paraquat gets to be one of our only options as we're talking about mm -hmm. herbicide resistance. And so um, that's, I think, you know, we've got a lot more Paraquat going out than I think what we used to. And so I think it's important to make sure that we get them the first time we do it, because if you burn the leaves off, we've just made them really mad and that much harder right. to kill. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Okay, I also uh, got a question here the other day, and we were talking about adjuvants, and you spent quite a bit of time going through those. I had a person ask me if there is a certain adjuvant that does a better job cutting through that waxy layer on leaves when we're trying to get herbicide down to the leaf surface. So crop oil versus MSO versus something else. You know, I that could be... Um... It could be weed, weed specific, but in general, kind of the general rule is, is that the MSO is always a slightly hotter for most weeds and they'll do a better job compared to the COC. Um, again, there's cases where that might not be the case, but uh, one in doubt, I would probably lean more towards the MSO as being a little bit hotter uh, than the COC. Okay. All right. If anyone else has questions here, if you want to just raise your hand, you can ask Cody in person, or you can put them in the in the Q and A box, or even in the chat box. We'll we'll get them to Cody. Um, you know, we talked a lot about post emergence applications on this stuff. You know. I always get asked how much how much moisture does it take to activate a pre, and I know that plays a role into what products we're using. Is there a good place for folks to go look those kinds of numbers up that you refer folks to? I don't know that there's a good place, like a one-stop shop for all of that. Uh, right. and, and that's a challenge too, because um, it depends on so many variables. It depends on the amount of residue that's on the surface. It depends on the herbicide. You know, if it was bare soil, you could get by with, with a lot less rainfall, right? But if it's if you have a lot of wheat residue, you got to get, a, you know, it has to wash off the wheat residue and get down into the soil to be effective. And so there's a lot there. Uh, for most uh, for most herbicides, you're going to have to be in, a, you know, that quarter inch to half inch range to get it where it needs to be and get it activated. All right, that sounds good. So, okay, if anybody else has any more questions, put them in the uh, Q&A box. Cody, after he gets done with his presentation here, he'll still be able to see the Q&A box. So if you've got questions, put them in and we can have Cody type answers to you as we go. So with that, thank you, Cody, very much for joining us and for going through that presentation. I know everybody is trying to figure out how to get good weed control and it's sure a challenge when we're struggling so much with this. So thank yeah. you for going through a lot of that discussion.